want to welcome you here today uh, as we come now to uh, continue uh, our series on uh, how our focus creates our reality. And uh, one of the things that we need to look at in that respect is, uh, you know, what, what prevents us from living to our fullest potential? And so to address one of those issues, we're going to, uh, or aspects, is we're going to begin our reading from Exodus in the Hebrew Bible, Exodus 32, 1 through 6. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron, Aaron was his brother, and said to him, Come, make gods, plural, for us who shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has happened to him. And Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them and formed it in a mold and cast an image of a calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who have brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to God. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being and the people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to revel. Our reading from the New Testament is going to be from the Cherokee New Testament, and you can get a copy of the Cherokee New Testament from the Cherokee Nation gift shop. Uh, online and uh, there's also some books on uh, some, some introductory books on understanding Cherokee language and also understanding the syllabary how to read and speak Cherokee and so uh, uh, in an effort to exemplify cultural competency we're going to be using the Cherokee New Testament uh, in addition to reading in English so uh, let's open our, our, our New Testaments to Maga, Ayadlo, uh, Ayado Lai 7, 21 through 23. And I'm using printout because the lettering is a little small for me to read these days. <laughs> Joys of getting old. Awene Yona Nadayan Dale Nahi Yawi Una Wi Didale Hanska Uyo Adana Ple De I Yo Sapi Adayone Di Ye Sampi Ude Le Da Dini Sidi Ye Sampi Ada His Di Ye Sampi Ganoski di da ye san yi Jagawalo de Gaya his di ye san yi Uyo iya nan di ye san yi Garona de he da ye san yi Hale so flan his do di ye se han yi Ada yo ge di ye san yi Adaso Glan is do, di, Adlan go po, do diya, Adiz ga, na wiz di, ye, san hi. Hi a, 
نازگی نگردم یا ای آوینی دیداره هست یا ای آره گرده هست نوانی ها یا وی دیمه نا Mark chapter 7, 21 through 23. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. A cloud called do. Pride. Pride, the greatest evil, prevents people from living to their fullest potential. Now, in the book of Exodus, we read where the people came out of Egypt following Moses after everything that we, they had been through, after everything that God had done for them. They got to the mountain. Moses is gone for a while. They don't say how long. And the people just like, hey, you know, he's not here. We want to do our thing. We want to do it our way. Because we really think that our guy is the one who brought us out and not the God of Moses. After everything they've been through, they thought these things, and they went to Aaron, Moses' brother, and said, let's do this. And uh, we don't hear whether, you know, Aaron put up a fuss or not about having to do it, but what we do hear is that he went along. He went along to get along. And then he went the extra step, and he built an altar, and he said, hey, let's have a big thing. And the people went crazy. You know, they went, they were doing their drinking and whatever. And, uh, you know, there's more to the story after that about what happened. But pride got the better of them at that point and set them up for the fall. And so uh, we, we understand these stories about how pride can do these things. And the reason we can understand these stories and remember these teachings is because of what happened to Possum's Tale. Now, there's a really good book for children, it's a children's book, it's called Cherokee Animal Tales uh, by George uh, Shear, illustrated by Robert Frankenberg. And if you want to read some stories, little children's stories, they're very informative, very educational about Cherokee cultural and uh, moral traditions. And the story in here in this respect is uh, the council came together, the animals, the council of animals came together. This is back when animals and people could talk to each other. And they, they were able to talk to each other and they had their own council, very, very intelligent. And, uh, you know, back then, Possum had a real bushy tail, and we're talking very, very uh, well-groomed, nice looking tail. And he was very proud of it, too. He loved to show it off in all the dances. He'd, he'd go crazy about that. And Rabbit, who was the messenger for the council, was told that uh, there was going to be a dance. Now, you have to understand that Rabbit is, is trickster and Bear got his tail. That's a different story. But so that made him envious of Possum's tail. So Rabbit made a point of going around and telling everybody about the big dance and making sure that Possum knew. And Possum, being kind of full of himself, Prideful, decided that he deserved to have a seat of honor at the dance. And Rabbit said, 
we're going to give you the seat of honor. Because Fawson put on a big show and they were going to have him come up and do the dance. And uh, so, you know, Rabbit kind of talked to Fawson and he turned on the charm and the deviousness, which he's known for. And Rabbit convinced Fawson that this dance was so important and that Fawson's tail was so wondrous that they needed to be really special and taking care of it. Fawson, of course, you know, he bought into it, no line and sinker. He, he went for it. He fell head on to, hey, this is going to be good for me. And uh, so Fawson talked to Cricket. And they, they came up with a plan. And Rabbit told Fawson, Cricket, he's the best rumor there is. So you just, we'll bring him over. And if you'll groom your tail in a very special way, so when it comes time for the dance, it'll look better than ever. Impress everybody to no end. And of course, Austin, awesome. he's like, he's all about that. He's ready to do that. So Rabbit goes and gets Cricket, and they talk, and they've got this plan. And what they do is they grab, or they bring some, uh, some red cloth strips, and they wrap it around Possum's tail to lay the fur down flat. And they told Possum that they needed to do that so that Cricket could trim the fur perfectly. And that he can't take it, the, the cloth off until he goes to the dance. And Possum, he's ready for it. He's ready to do it. He does it. So they tie his fur down real close to the, to the tail. And Cricket begins grooming. And what he does actually is he snips the hairs real close to the to the tail, the skin. He goes all the way down and spends many days working on this very carefully, putting on the big show of doing things real good. And he snips all the hair down, all the way off, but it's tied to the tail, so possum can't, he doesn't know what's going on. He thinks everything's perfect. The day comes, he gets there, and he's given the seat of honor at the dance. And the elders are done doing their thing, and the drumming begins, and the first dance is called. Possum goes up to do that dance because he's the honored guest, so he does the first dance. And he gets out there, and Cricket snips that cloth that's holding that fur down. And while Possum's dancing, that cloth unravels and the fur just flies everywhere. And Possum's tail is bare. And all the animals start snickering and giggling and laughing a little bit. And Possum thinks that they're cheering him on. So he goes even faster and wilder and spinning and flipping and doing all kinds of things. And the people keep laughing and clapping and it just keeps on going more and more and finally it's so hilarious that everybody starts laughing so hard they start crying and falling over and Possum like what is going on and he looks around and he sees his bare tail and he realizes how foolish he has been and he runs from the dance hiding in shame and ever since then Possum's tails have been bare to remind the people of the consequences of Clyde's. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, which he wrote a long time ago during World War II, he did radio talk shows about it, he considers pride to be the greatest sin, which is why I made that statement at the beginning. From his perspective, all other wrongdoings, all other evils come from pride. And the reading from Exodus was not chosen by accident. From, according to the Hebrew peoples, the Jewish people, the original sin was not Moses, or not, excuse me, not Adam and Eve. I've talked about this before. They just considered that to be a story of kids. They did what kids would do. 
because kids are immature. They don't know any better. But grown-ups do know better. At least in theory, right? And so for them, the original sin is from this reading in the book of Moses. When after everything that had been done for them by a creator, by their God, something didn't go their way, so they decided to turn their back on God and do their own thing. And they built their foundation at that point on sand. <clears throat> we all have heard this story where Jesus has said, and he said it here in, in, the, in the Gospel of my God, Mark, a house built on sand will not stand. And I thought about reading that verse this morning too as an illustration, but I wanted to give you a context of how, from Jesus' perspective, Jesus says here in the Gospel of my God, that all these evils come from within and not from without. That means we choose to be prideful, we choose to be deceitful, we choose to be thieves, we choose to be murderers. It is not thrust upon us. As adults, we know the difference between right and wrong, good and bad for ourselves. We know if we are choosing to be prideful. War, violence, corruption, all these things come from pride, according to C.S. Lewis. He considers it to be the original sin. And you can find that in his book, Mere Christianity. It was written on page, begins on page 121, The Great Sin. And, uh, you know, it's it's really something that he, he gets in with. Uh, he says greed and everything else comes from that. And I got curious, being a uh, being a clinician, I got a little very curious about this. From a contemporary research perspective, pride and compassion. You know, I hear patients many times talking about, at least here in Oklahoma, how they don't want to help anybody outside of their own little world because they don't think it's right that they should have to take care of other people. That they should only have to take care of their own. Of course, most of these people are, in my experience, you know, manipulating the system as much as they can to get as much as they can for themselves and not the least bit concerned with anybody else. And of course, many of these people have chronic health problems uh, created by themselves, but they manifest out of their own, uh, their own uh, woundedness, emotional, spiritual woundedness. And so I looked at some contemporary research, and lo and behold, there has been some recent research, and I mean really recent. This was done in 2010. And it reflects a contrast between how pride influences, well, the title of it is Compassion, Pride, and Social Intuitions of Self-Other Similarity. And what basically that interpret translates to in lay terms is, how is pride how does pride influence compassion and a person's ability to see others as equal to themselves or inferior to themselves? And the researchers, uh, Christopher Obvious, uh, Harvard University, and E.J. Hornberg, and Dacre uh, Keltner from the University of California, Berkeley, point out that on their, based on their research that people Tend, there are a lot of charts and graphs and results and all kinds of stuff in here. People, human beings, tend to connect themselves more with people who are successful, powerful, wealthy. 
than they do with people who are less than those. In other words, they tend to gravitate towards people who consider themselves to be superior morally and culturally. And they tend to hang out with people who have no compunction whatsoever about exploiting others for their own personal gain. Do you fall in that category? Do you do that? Are you prideful in that context? People who are prideful minimize the value and worth of others and use that prideful motivation to justify their abuse and exploitation of others for their own personal gain or their antipathy towards others who are suffering. Esau said this is building a foundation on sand. You think about the uh, missionaries to North America, their foundation was built out of pridefulness. They were motivated by pride. And that has carried on through the Protestant denomination across North America even to this day. Pride influences our culture in many, many ways. Contemporary culture, even Indians are now becoming influenced by pridefulness. Pride led to the conquest of North America to build communities at the expense of the communities that were already here. Pride led to social injustice to the point that it caused wounded knee. And even today is responsible for the hopelessness and disparity that exists among the young American Indian and Native American communities all over North America. Rightfulness, from my perspective, is equal to what C.S. Lewis says. It is the great sin. We have a duty and responsibility to humble ourselves before our Creator and all of creation and realize that we are not no greater than anyone else. We are different. We are not great. Otherwise, we will continue to reject those who are vulnerable and remain attracted to the strength that comes from those who have no moral conscience and value wealth and power more than they do honoring the sacredness of God and the sacredness of all life. We have to decide whether or not sacrificing our willingness to live on God's terms is greater than our desire to be comfortable, to be powerful, to go along to get along, basically to survive, or remain in that survival context. So where your focus is, is where your reality is. Do you really trust in God? Do you really believe that you should be living the heart of God, as Esau calls us to do here? Are you going to be a person who is defiled in the eyes of Esau, in the eyes of God? Or are you going to be a person who is revered? honored by God and the people for their humility and service. What if you have a willingness to truly trust in God and let go of pride and embrace living the heart of God? 
through your demonstrations of compassion and caring towards vulnerable populations. What is it? Walk in view. What is it?